Hello everybody, today I am uh, delivering the lecture 2 of module 1 in the course vibration of continuous system. In the last class, I have introduced the course, told you about the different technical terms used in vibration study and also told you what is the di di uh, difference between the discrete system and continuous system. Then I started a modeling system of dynamic problem that was of single degree freedom model and I discussed about the uh, undamped vibration and damped vibration. In this connection, I have shown how the decay of the uh, time response takes place uh, when the uh, system is having a damping. Different types of damping I have introduced. Now, today I want to cover the time domain analysis of linear system subjected to harmonic input. Okay. So, outlines of today's lecture is first I will discuss the general approach for the time domain analysis of linear system. Then I will uh, show you the decaying nature of the time response of under dam model. Then I will discuss about the damped oscillator under harmonic motion, uh, especially the time history analysis. Then I will introduce the magnification factor and resonance phenomenon. Then a special technique known as half power bandwidth that is used for determining the damping ratio will be discussed. Okay. Now, let us see uh, how a time domain analysis of linear system can be performed. A linear system as you see is characterized by the m c k which are the system parameters and these are time invariant and uh, x y z are the special domain in which we measure the response as well as the exciting force and t is the time instant. So, these are the parameters involved in uh, linear systems and uh, this L represents a differential operator because the linear system is represented by a second order uh, ordinary differential equation for the discrete system whereas, it will be a partial differential equation in continuous system, but the order of differential equation in continuous system may be 4 or may be uh, 2 also depending on whether the vibration of beams and plates are considered or the axial vibration of bar or torsional vibration of the shaft is considered. Now, in the linear analysis you can see that input is given to the system, input is in terms of exciting force or it may be a in terms of initial conditions. So, input again it is uh, defined in terms of the space coordinates as well as in the time t. So, once the input is given to the system it will respond to this input and it will produce a output which is again measured at a some point or some location and therefore, output is again a function of space that is x y z as well as the function of time in the linear system it is shown that output r can be obtained after convoluting the input with the a function i which is known as impulse assessment function. Actually impulse assessment function contain the system parameters or physical parameters of the system you can call it just like your mass or mass moment of inertia then damping and stiffness. So, when this convolution is carried out then we get the output, but special feature of the linear system is that the input characteristics will be reflected in the output of the system. Okay. So, let us see how a general approach can be outlined for the time domain analysis in linear system. Here let us see the vibration analysis of continuous system actually it involves the boundary value as well as initial value problem. 
but the continuous system again for the solution purpose is reduced to a discrete system of infinite number of generalized coordinates. So, therefore, the knowledge of discrete system is necessary which will aid the solution of the continuous system. Therefore, we shall first see how the uh, discrete system can be analyzed to initial value problem, initial conditions as well as the excitation of the external agency. Now, since continuous system is a special case of discrete system, the initial value problem has common method of solution. In both the cases, you will find that similar type of solution appears in the initial value problem. The initial value problem in time domain method of dynamic analysis involves solution of second order differential equation subjected to initial condition. However, if the second order system is non-homogeneous means in absence of exciting force or driving force, the system equation is homogeneous. That means, you can see here a differential equation is written which is having constant coefficient a b c for our purpose, but it may have also the coefficient variable in space. Okay. But now at this moment we are considering the inertia properties, stiffness and the damping are uniform in the domain of the structure or the system. So, here you can see a second order linear equation because it is linear you can see that uh, the variable x and its derivative are with a single power there is no second order power of the x or x dot or x double dot. So, therefore, we call it a linear equation and f t is the exciting force which may be of any form. It is not necessary that f t will be always a harmonic function that is it represents a oscillation or wave it may be of any form. So, given this linear system we have to find the solution of for x using the theory of differential equation. The theory of differential equation says that for non homogeneous system in case of linear differential equation the general solution is obtained after finding the solution of the homogeneous equation and superimposing this to the solution of the non homogeneous equation. The solution of the non homogeneous equation is called the particular integral. So, it involves two steps. In the first step, we have to obtain the solution of the homogeneous equation that means, right hand side of the equation is taken to be 0 and then with the given exciting force f t whatever may be its nature, we have to find the particular integral and then we will superimpose. So, this is the general method. Okay. Now, because of uh, this damping present in the system, every material has some amount of damping. Even the vehicle tire which is inflated with air has some damping. So, this is due to air damping, but the nature of damping may be different. Sometimes the damping is linearly varying with the velocity, sometimes it is non-linearly varying with the velocity, but for our purpose we will take the linear damping which is known as viscous damping because this uh, if I call the damping force F d which will be proportional to the velocity that is F d equal to c into x dot. So, x dot is the velocity if x is the displacement its time derivative first derivative is the velocity second derivative is the acceleration. Okay. Now, we have seen in my earlier lecture uh, you have also noted it that uh, the system may have three types of damping one is critically damped system and uh, another is over damped system and then third one is under damped system. So, over damped system you will find some speciality that c by 2 m this parameter squared is greater than k by m whereas, in critical damping case it is equal to k by m and under damped case it is equal to k by m. So, in under damp case if I define the damping ratio j is equal to less than 1 
most of the engineering system are under dam. So, therefore, it is showing the oscillatory nature of the motion. Uh, however, the increase of damping may cause earlier decay of the motion if the force is withdrawn. Suppose, for example, in a system the force is applied and it will go on oscillating until the force exists, but after the force is withdrawn then the motion will be under free vibration and decay under free vibration will be fast if the damping parameter is higher. So, that you should know if the damping is increased decay will be faster compared to lower damping ratio. Now, for free vibration case we take F t equal to 0 and after dividing both sides by m and taking F t equal to 0 we now get this equation x double dot plus 2 j omega n x dot plus omega n square x equal to 0. The solution of this equation is known to us and it is equal to e to the power minus j omega n t where omega n is the natural frequency of the system and it is equal to root over k by m. Then multiplied by a cos omega d t plus b sin omega d t. Omega d is the damped natural frequency. So, there is a difference between the damped natural frequency and undamped natural frequency that you have noted in my earlier lecture in which case the damped natural frequency is related to the undamped natural frequency by a factor 1 minus j square under the root. So, for uh, lightly damped system if j is very small then 1 minus j square is also equal to approximately 1. So, in that case the undamped natural frequency damped natural frequency will be equal, but there is a difference because truly speaking the natural frequency in case of damp vibration omega d is equal to omega n root over 1 minus omega n square. Okay. Now, you see the earlier equation this equation can be written including the phase angle. So, that is written here capital X is the amplitude and uh, phi is the phase angle. So, it is written as x capital X e to the power minus j omega n t into sin omega d t plus phi. So, at uh, any instant of time the amplitude j a x that is the amplitude of the motion, but it is decaying this amplitude will not be constant as in case of free vibration. So, here you will find the decay of the amplitude okay. and this forms an envelope. The envelope is x e to the power minus j omega n t, where you can see that uh, this uh, amplitude depends on the initial condition of the motion and uh, the natural frequency natural frequency damping and initial condition of the motion. Similarly, the phase angle also depend on the, the initial condition the damping ratio as well as natural frequency, because once you know the damping ratio and natural frequency you can get the omega d. The capital X e to the power minus j omega n t is the envelope and you can see that how the motion is decaying. Okay. Now, our intention is to use this decaying curve for a uh, certain cases. So, for example, a free vibration record is available that is motion is gradually decaying and it is coming to the rest. So, from that record we are interested to find what is the damping of the system or what is the damping ratio. So, that can be done by using this the expression for x t at any two instant. So, for example, if I take the amplitude at t is equal to t 1 which is x e to the power minus j omega n t 1 into sin omega d t 1 plus phi. Then one period apart another peak, but 
because of damping you can appreciate that this peak will be lower than the earlier peak. So, therefore, uh, we get this uh, at a time instant T 2, T 2 is nothing but uh, T 1 plus T d okay. because it is a periodic motion. So, therefore, we can write x T 2 equal to x e to the power minus omega n into T 1 plus T d into sin omega d and in place of uh, T 2 I have written T 1 plus capital T d plus phi, phi is the phase angle. Okay. Now, in order to utilize this expression to find out the damping, we first define a parameter which is known as logarithmic decrement. So, logarithmic decrement is denoted by delta and it is given by log with the natural base of x t 1 by x t 2. So, we write now after substituting x t 1 here and x t 2 from here in the denominator. Uh, first, I will write this x t 1 and then I will write the x t 2. Okay. Now, you can see here that after elapsing a period time period of the motion the repetition of motion is seen because it is a harmonic vibration free harmonic vibration all free vibrations are harmonic vibration of harmonic nature. So, therefore, utilizing the property of periodic function we can now see that delta becomes xi is the damping ratio omega n T d because you can see here omega d T 1 plus T d will be again omega d t 1 because you see that sin phi equal to sin 2 pi plus phi if 2 pi is a period. Now, in that case t d is a period. So, t 1 plus t d sin of omega d t 1 plus t d plus phi will be nothing but sin omega d t 1 plus phi. So, therefore, after cancelling some common term we will get xi omega n t d. Now, t d is the time period of the motion and time period is defined by 2 pi by omega d. So, 2 pi into omega d, omega d is omega n root over 1 minus xi square. Now, since omega n will appear in the denominator, so this omega n will be cancelled. So, we are left with, with the expression delta equal to 2 pi xi divided by root over 1 minus xi square. For light damping when xi is very very less than 1, we can neglect xi square and therefore, delta this logarithmic decrement is equal to 2 pi delta. So, we obtain the logarithmic decrement in terms of damping ratio and therefore, damping ratio is uh, obtained as xi equal to delta by 2 pi. So, let us illustrate this with an example. Okay. Now, in example uh, of this uh, logarithmic decrement, I have selected a problem in which case the amplitude after certain period is ob recorded. Uh, in experimental observation, you will get sometimes uh, very noisy data at some time instant, but you will find some clear data. So, in that case, uh, some data may be ignored. So, it is not necessary that you have to take the conjugative peaks. Peak seen clearly after say jth cycle or nth cycle can also be taken. So, here is an example. It is observed that the vibration amplitude of a damped single degree freedom system had been reduced by 50 percent after 5 complete cycles. So, conjugative uh, cycle information is not given. After completing fifth cycle, five cycle, the amplitude reduction is known to us. Now, assuming that it is a viscously damped system, we are required to find the damping ratio. Now, let us see how we can solve this problem. So, let x 1 be the amplitude after one cycle. 
and x 2 be the amplitude after j complete j complete cycle after elapsing the j jth uh, cycle we can now measure the amplitude x 2 or clearly this record is visible. So, therefore, the ratio x 1 by x 2 here x 2 will not be there because this will be your amplitude at after j jth complete cycle. So, this amplitude instead of x 2 please see in the original formula it was a ratio of x 1 by x 2, but here after complete j cycle we are now getting the amplitude. So, therefore, the ratio is written as x 1 divided by x j plus 1 and it becomes e to the power j omega n j t d. Why it is? Because after multiple of integral multiple of any period again we are getting the repetition of the uh, cycles. So, therefore, this formula that I have written is similar to that we have got in the earlier cases only here the j term is coming that is it is seen after j cycle. Okay. Now, this ratio x 1 by x j plus 1 can be written like that x 1 by x 2 into x 2 by x 3 into x 3 by x 4 like that up to x j divided by x j plus 1. Now, take log of both sides. So, if I talk take log of both sides then it is uh, log x 1 by x j plus 1 and then log x 1 by x 2 log x 2 by x 3 log x 3 by x 4 like that up to log x j by x j 1 and you can see that each of this term is nothing by delta by definition that is the logarithmic decrement which is defined as the ratio of the successive amplitude. Okay. So, in that case each of the term here in the right hand side is delta, but there are j number of terms. So, it is j into delta. Now, we get delta that is the logarithmic decrement equal to 1 by j log x 1 by x j plus 1, because we are knowing only these two peak x 1 and x j plus 1 other peaks intermediate peaks are not recorded. Okay. So, for the present problem we have uh, j is equal to 5 and x 1 by x j 1 j plus 1 that is 50 percent reduction. So, we are getting it is 2. So, therefore, delta becomes 1 by 5 log uh, base e of 2. So, therefore, after putting the numerical value of that the j uh, the damping ratio becomes 0 0.022. So, this is the concept of logarithmic decrement and which can be applied in practical field to measure the damping from experimental data or recorded data. Okay. Now, let us start the time domain analysis of damped oscillator under harmonic motion. So, here I will consider the uh, non-homogeneous solution of the equation, because here this uh, forcing function is existing. It is not the free vibration case although some initial condition may be there in this system, but now we are mostly interested to find the forcing part that means force vibration part that is called the particular integral. Okay. So, the model is described by this differential equation m x double dot plus c x dot plus k x equal to f t. Substituting f t is equal to p cos omega t because we have assumed that the system is under harmonic excitation. So, a harmonic force can be a sine function or can be a cosine function. So, substituting this f t here and then divide both sides by m we get x double dot plus 2 j omega n into x dot plus omega n square x equal to p by m cos omega n t because c by m equal to 2 j omega n. So, therefore, we get this term and omega n square is nothing but k by m. So, general solution of this equation has to be obtained in two steps. First, we have to obtain the homogeneous solution 
and then we have to obtain the particular integral. Now, homogeneous solution we know in terms of integral uh, constants of integration. So, we will focus uh, our discussion to the particular integral now and then we will write the general solution superimposing the homogeneous solution also with the particular integral. Okay. Now, let us see how this differential equation non-homogeneous differential equation can be solved. There is a method in the theory of differential equation which is known as method of undetermined coefficients. So, this method uh, based on the concept that in the linear case you have to choose a particular integral which reflects the characteristics of the input. So, in this case we are having uh, different types of function may be there in the um, non-homogeneous part that is a forcing uh, part, but here we are mostly concerned with the harmonic vibration. So, that is a sin function and cos function. So, I have given a general table here, okay, general table here in which uh, by following which the functions can be chosen. Okay. So, you can see here if the type of the function is k into x to the power n or k into e to the power p t exponential function, then we can select the particular solution as another constant k 1 e to the power p t, because particular solution will reflect the characteristics of the input. So, that is the basic theory of linear differential equation. Now, in the instant case where the system is vibrated by a harmonic force. We are now assuming the function either as cosine function or sine function. So, in that case the particular function or uh, particular integral can be chosen as c 1 cos p t plus c 2 sin p t. These two uh, trigonometrical function that cos and sin will lead you to a expression which will give amplitude as well as phase angle. Then if a uh, particular integral is a constant, constant force, uh, choice of x p will be also a constant. As it is a linear differential equation, the particular integral will be chosen based on the characteristics or features of the forcing function non homogeneous part. Okay. So, in that case we have chosen this x p equal to c 1 sin omega t plus c 2 cos omega t. After time differentiation because we have the terms x dot and x dot p. So, x dot is determined as c 1 cos omega t minus c 2 sin omega t into omega. Then x double dot p is determined as minus c c 1 sin omega t plus c 2 cos omega t omega square. So, these are determined after substituting this value x p here in this differential equation and you can see after differentiation these terms are obtained. Okay. So, when x p x dot p and x double dot p are substituted in the differential equation, then we get uh, the left hand side as c 1 sin omega t plus c 2 cos omega t of course, negative sign is there omega square that is x double dot. Then we are getting 2 j omega n omega into c 1 cos omega t minus c 2 sin omega t because it is with the velocity term. So, therefore, first derivative was taken and omega was coming here. Similarly, in case of this uh, third term omega n square and then x whatever we assumed we have written here, right hand side is delta s t. How delta s t is coming? You can see p by m. Okay. Now, p by k is delta s t and m is k by m is omega n square. So, utilizing these two values t is equal to k into delta s t and k by m is equal to omega n square, we can find here the right hand side as delta s t omega n square cos omega n t. So, we get this step 
after that we rearrange uh, in this fashion. So, that we can uh, separate coefficient of like terms in both the sides. We are interested to find the coefficient of uh, this sin and cosine, because our left hand side that is forcing function is cosine function. So, we will equate the coefficient of like terms from the both sides and this will lead to the formation of two simultaneous algebraic equation which needs to be solved to find out the unknown c 1 and c 2. Now, after manipulating this we are writing that omega n square minus omega square c 1 minus twice j omega n omega c 2 sin omega t. So, sin omega t coefficient is now omega n square minus omega square into c 1 minus 2 j omega n omega c 2. Similarly, the coefficient of cos omega t is now cos omega t is you can write is this is the coefficient omega n square minus omega square into c 2 plus 2 j omega n omega c 1 cos omega t equal to delta s t omega n square cos omega n t. Okay. You can note here that uh, in the left hand side we have sin omega t as well as cos omega t with some constant term as coefficients. In the right hand side we have only cos omega t. So, equating the coefficient of like terms coefficient of sin omega t whatever you get here will be 0 because there will be uh, no terms like sin omega t in the right hand side. Whereas, the coefficient of cos omega n t from both the sides if we equate we will get omega n square minus omega square into c 2 plus 2 j 2 j omega n omega into c 1 equal to delta s t delta s t omega n square. Okay delta s t omega n square. Okay. So, therefore, we get two equations here after equating the coefficient of sin omega t and cos omega t and this equation can be solved by any standard rule. Now, here I will choose uh, the Kramers rule to solve this equation. Okay. If I choose the Kramers rule, then first let us find the determinant uh, which will be formed by the coefficient of c 1 and c 2. So, this determinant is this d is equal to omega n square omega square uh, that is the first row first column and first row uh, second column is minus 2 j omega n omega like that second row first column is written and second row second column is written and uh, after expanding we will get omega n square minus omega square whole square plus 2 j omega n omega whole square. Then constant c 1 using the Kramers rule will be c 1 equal to determinant 0 delta s t omega n square. Why this is 0? First column uh, the first column first row element is 0 because the coefficient of sin omega t is 0 okay. and coefficient of cos omega t we are getting. So, therefore, here 0 is written delta s t omega n square in the uh, first row second column minus 2 j omega n omega and uh, second row second column omega n square minus omega square divided by d. So, this is uh, c 1 an expression for c 1 after simplification it is found as 2 j omega by omega n into delta s t divided by 1 minus omega by omega n square whole square plus 2 j omega by omega n whole square. Now, here you should note very carefully that omega is the driving frequency, this is the frequency of the exciting force, whereas omega n is the natural frequency of the system which depends on the physical parameters of the system that is mass and stiffness. So, uh, that is inherent in the system and uh, if you change the mass or if you change the stiffness only this omega n will change, but whether 
you increase the amplitude of the force or frequency of the force, this will not influence the omega n. Okay. So, here I have written this C 1 as with this ratio that is very important that is called frequency ratio omega by omega n. So, in terms of omega by omega n I have written and delta S t is the static displacement which is uh, here in that case is the p is the amplitude of the force divided by stiffness k. Okay. Introducing a term r which is called frequency ratio I write this equation c 1 again in this form twice j r delta S t divided by 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r whole square. Okay. Similarly, we can find other constant c 2. So, c 2 is found as determinant of this uh, omega n square omega square 2 j omega n omega and 0 delta S t omega n square divided by the determinant formed by the coefficient of this c 1 and c 2. And here you can note the second column is the non homogeneous part that is 0 and sigma S t omega n square. After expanding this determinant and with the division of d, we ultimately arrive at this uh, expression c 2 equal to 1 minus r square, r is nothing but omega by omega n into delta S t divided by 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square. Now, we obtain c 1 and c 2. So, we can find the uh, particular integral. So, x p is c 1 plus c 1 sin omega t plus c 2 cos omega t. So, substituting c 1 and c 2 here, we can now write x p that is the particular integral delta S t divided by root over 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r whole square into 2 j r sin omega t plus 1 minus r square cos omega t. You should note that this uh, denominator is under the root. Okay. So, frequency ratio is a very important parameter which will influence the particular integral. Now, let us introduce the phase angle. So, phase angle is defined as phi and in that case we assume that the parameter the coefficient of sin omega t is sin phi sin phi. So, we have written here uh, this divided by this is sin phi of course, delta S t we have taken separately. Similarly, coefficient of cos omega t 1 minus r square divided by root over 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square is again another term that is assumed as cos phi, because when you square it and add you will get 1. So, this may represent sin phi and cos phi. So, writing this as sin phi and cos phi, then x p is written as sigma s t divided by root over 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square cos omega t minus phi, because you know that cos phi cos omega t plus sin phi sin omega t can be written as cos omega t minus phi. So, now the response is written in terms of phase angle and amplitude. So, this is the amplitude of the motion. So, one thing you can note the frequency ratio and damping is very important which will influence the uh, amplitude of the motion. However, if the damping is small, the effect of damping in amplitude of the harmonic response will be not significant. Okay. Now, what we get actually? We got earlier that is the particular integral, but this is not the full solution. Full solution is obtained after superimposing the homogeneous part. So, homogeneous part is due to initial condition and therefore, A and B contains the initial condition, should contain the initial condition and other parameters also. So, to apply the initial condition, one should not use this expression in isolation. 
that will be wrong. When you want to find the constants of integration a and b, you have to consider the general solution which includes the homogeneous part as well as the particular integral. Now, irrespective of the nature of the forcing part, generally we get a transient part first. So, transient part you will not get any characteristics of the driving frequency. So, driving frequency will not influence the transient part. This is the transient part where the single frequency that is the natural frequency of the system or if it is a system with several degrees then combination of uh, two three frequencies may also influence the initial portion that is the transient portion. But transient portion will uh, gradually decrease depending on the magnitude of the damping. If the damping is large the transient part will be very small so of, of small duration and then in case of harmonic vibration a steady state oscillation will take place. So, you can see the steady state oscillation is again a harmonic function with the driving frequency as omega which is nothing but the frequency of the exciting force. So, response frequency is again omega that is the characteristics of the linear system and uh, therefore, you are getting the steady state part and uh, you can see here that frequency time period of steady state part is twice pi by omega which is equal to the time period of the your exciting force or driving force. Tangent part is mainly influenced by initial conditions, natural frequency and damping ratio whereas, steady state part depends mainly on the amplitude of force and driving frequency. Although some influence of damping is there because tau is there, but for small damping this damping influence will be very small in the steady state part. So, in a damped system steady state motion is not much altered by the, uh, the change of damping if it is a within a limit and then you will get the full motion, but now we are interested to know the steady state part what happens if the driving frequency approaches the natural frequency of the system. Okay. You can see here in the steady state part the delta st is the static response and it is multiplied by a factor 1 upon root over 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square 2 j r whole square. So, this factor 1 upon under root 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square is called the magnification factor because it is magnifying the uh, altering the static response delta s t. So, we identify the um, magnification factor as m f equal to 1 by root over 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square and phase angle phi is 2 j r divided by 1 minus r square very interesting characteristics of the magnification factor is noted when we change the damping ratio from 0 to other finite value including the natural frequency in this range. So, here is a plot which shows the variation of magnification factor with the change of frequency ratio. Now, you can see for a undamped system when the j is 0 and uh, r is 1, there is no damping. So, omega n is equal to omega d. So, frequency ratio is uh, omega by omega n or omega n by omega is 1. So, in that case x become unbounded. So, at r is equal to 1 for a lightly damped system or you can see that this frequency ratio is 1, then resonance peak is uh, infinite. Okay. So, at r is equal to 1 resonance peak is infinite, but if damping is present the peak is a bounded. So, you will get a finite value of the peak and one thing you can see that if you increase the damping the 
sharpness of the peak is decreased. So, peak uh, this curve starts flattening. So, this is the characteristic if you increase the damping the curve will start flattening. So, for light damping that is when the resonance peak is sharp you will get the magnitude of the resonance peak is equal to delta S t divided by 2 j. Okay. Similarly, if we see the variation of the phase angle you can see that phase angle here for r is equal to 1 for undamped system it represents a discontinuous curve because at r is equal to 1 you will get unbounded that is uh, unbounded response corresponding to phi is equal to pi by 2. Okay. Now, for undamped system uh, phase angle for r less than 1 is 0 and uh, you will see that for again for undamped system frequency ratio greater than 1 the phase angle is pi. So, the motion is in phase with the uh, forcing function if the frequency ratio is less than 1 and it is out of phase if the frequency ratio is greater than 1. But when the damping is present you will get this uh, the phase angle variation and one thing you can note that all the curves passes through this point phi, uh, which is a straight line it is shown as phi is equal to pi by 2. Okay. Peak amplitude at frequency ratio. Now, question arises whether for damped system the peak is exactly at the r is equal to 1. Let us investigate it. Seeing the nature of the amplification factor, we can obviously tell that for light damping the peak is at the 1 and approximately at r is equal to 1, but let us find theoretically differentiating the magnification factor with respect to r and equating to 0, we get this ratio r is equal to root over 1 minus 2 j square. That means, the peak occurs at a frequency ratio root over 1 minus 2 j square, okay. but for lightly damped system it is approximately r is equal to 1. Some important points on the behavior of the dynamic system subjected to harmonic force with increase of damping frequency ratio at which resonance occurs shift towards left. For damped system resonance frequency is omega n equal to omega n root over 1 minus j square. At r is equal to 0 the body undergoes rigid body motion magnification factor is 1. For undamped system the magnification factor is unbounded. Okay. For phase angle plot all curves passes through phi is equal to pi by 2 at omega by omega n equal to 1. For undamped system r is equal to 1 the curve has discontinuity jumping from phi is equal to 0 to phi is equal to pi. For undamped system r less than 1 the motion is in phase with the exciting force since phi is equal to 0, but for undamped system r greater than 1 the motion is out of phase with exciting force with phi is equal to pi. Now, let us find uh, the magnification factor by another method that is a graphical method, because sometimes the, the solution of the differential equation or the step by step solution a rigorous algebra you may commit mistake there is a possibility. So, a graphical solution if it is available it will give the quick results and it will be accurate also because there will be less chance of error. So, m x double dot uh, plus c x dot plus k x equal to p cos omega t. Now, here it is inertia force m x double dot c x dot is the damping force and k x is the spring force. P is the amplitude of the exciting force and uh, we know that steady state um, motion or displacement is represented by capital X cos omega t minus phi. So, we have written this derivatives of x. Okay. Derivative of x that is the velocity is minus c omega capital X sin omega t minus phi and acceleration is minus omega square x cos omega t minus phi. Okay. So, if this is the spring force and uh, this is your displacement. So, velocity is at 90 degree phase c omega x where p is also 90 degree with the uh, displacement for 
any ratio not equal to not uh, exactly at the resonant frequency. So, k x is the spring force and uh, the acceleration uh, the inertia force is just out of phase with the spring force. So, if I draw a vector diagram then <coughs> this is uh, k x then c omega x is the damping force and omega m omega square x is the inertia force. So, complete the polygon like that and let us find now resultant. So, the base of the triangle is k minus m omega square x whereas, the altitude is c omega x. So, hypotenuse is the p. So, we can use the Pythagoras theorem and can write p square is equal to k minus m omega square whole square x square plus c omega x square. So, from this expression we can arrive x equal to p by root over k minus m omega square whole square plus c omega whole square. And in the similar fashion after certain manipulation we can get the magnitude of the force steady state response as omega s t root over 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square. So, this is the graphical method of finding this magnitude of the steady state response and the phase angle you can note here 10 phi is given by c omega x divided by this k m omega square into x and after introducing the frequency ratio and other relation k by m is equal to omega n square and your this uh, c by m is equal to 2 j omega n we can arrive at this phase angle 10 phi equal to 2 j r divided by 1 minus r square. Okay. Frequency response function, this function is defined as the response of the force subjected to unit amplitude of harmonic excitation. That means, subjected to harmonic excitation of unit amplitude, the harmonic excitation with frequency omega, but amplitude is 1. Now, I have written it in the complex form because you know that harmonic excitation may be represented by cosine or may be represented by sine. So, e to the power i omega t represents both sine and cosine of course, a phase angle is involved here. We assume the steady state response as x is equal to h omega e to the power i omega t and substituting this here in the system equation we can now find h omega is equal to 1 divided by k m omega square uh, plus i c omega. So, modulus of h omega that is the amplitude or mod of frequency response function is 1 upon k minus m omega square whole square plus c omega square. Now, we have seen the frequency response function or this the curve how the magnification factor varies with the frequency ratio. So, from that curve it is also possible to determine the damping. Now, uh, select a curve with some arbitrary damping and this is the resonance peak. The resonance peak is given by uh, this uh, sigma s t divided by root 2 j because this is the expression that we have found and we select two other points which are known as half power points and here the magnitude of the response is x max divided by root 2 that is 0 0.707 times of that resonance peaks. So, we get this two half power points on this curve. Why it is called half power? Because if you square it then it will be x square by root 2. So, since the power is related to energy or x square represents a energy like term. So, therefore, it is called half power points. Okay. Now, here omega 1 corresponding to first half power point on the left hand side of the peak is known as lower cut off frequency and on the right hand side of the peak the frequency corresponding to the half power point is known as uh, the upper cut off frequency. Now, it is shown that at half power point sigma s t divided by 1 root over 1 minus r square whole square plus 2 j r square equal to 1 by root 2 sigma s t delta s t divided by 2 j. 
So, from this equation if we attempt to solve r square, we get r square equal to 1 minus 2 j square plus 2 j root over 1 minus j square. Neglecting the square of the j square, we ultimately got uh, the two frequency ratio that is lower frequency ratio and upper frequency ratio as r 1 square equal to 1 minus 2 j square minus 2 j from where we get r 1 equal to root over 1 minus 2 j plus j square and another this frequency ratio that is upper frequency ratio is r 2 square equal to 1 minus 2 j square plus 2 j which is equal to r 2 equal to root over 1 plus 2 j minus j square. Now, this expression inside the square root term can be written as 1 plus or minus something raised to the power half and this can be expanded by binomial theorem and neglecting the higher order terms and retaining only the first term. We can now write that r 1 equal to 1 minus j minus j square and r 2 is equal to 1 plus j minus j square. So, these two frequencies ratios are obtained. Then the difference of these two frequencies ratio is obviously 2 j. So, therefore, we can write now r 2 as omega 2 by omega n minus r 1, r 1 we can write omega 1 by omega n equal to 2 j. So, this is omega 2 minus omega 1 that term in the numerator is nothing but bandwidth. So, delta omega is the bandwidth of the curve and omega n is the natural frequency. So, from this expression we can get the damping ratio. So, from frequency response curve also we can find the damping ratio as well as from logarithmic decrement of the free decay we obtain the damping ratio. So, in summary uh, let us see what we have uh, discussed today. In this lecture, a general procedure of superposition of homogeneous solution with particular integral for second order time invariant system representing damped oscillator was discussed. Following the procedure, a case of harmonic excitation in a damped oscillator was illustrated. Magnification factor, phase angle relationship with frequency ratio was described. Logarithmic decrement of free decay, time history and half power bandwidth method in frequency response were illustrated for determination of damping factor. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.